This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 14, Krishna and the Gopis. Last episode, we met the young Krishna and his fellow cowherds living and playing in Vrindavan. The tribe was originally in Vraja, along the Yamuna River, but after some demon attacks and other bad omens, they decided to move to Vrindavan along the Ganges. The demonic attacks continued, but they were no match for Krishna, who managed to defeat each one of them. As he grew older, Krishna made bigger enemies, including the god Indra, who tried to wash the gopas away in a massive downpour. This too was easily deflected by Krishna, and Indra soon realized he was no longer top god. Krishna was the new boss. Before we get started with this episode, I should warn you that there's some pretty grown-up material here. I know that we've covered some raunchy stuff in the past, but this next story is as close to medieval pornography as it gets, so be warned, if you're too prudish for this kind of thing, you can always skip to the next episode, where we get back to the good old blood and guts that the Mahabharata is famous for. As Krishna grew into a teenager, the girls were all falling for his good looks, and everyone else adored him. He promised the gopis that their wishes would be fulfilled that autumn, and that he would make love to each of them soon enough. Now that day had come. I'm a bit bashful about these things, so I'll let Vyasa tell the story. Now that Sharat, Autumn, whose nights are heady with the scent of Malika flowers, was upon Gokula and Vrindavan, Krishna decided he would sport at love with the women. The full moon rose and daubed the sky with the crimson blush. Krishna looked at the disk of the moon and saw Vrindavan bathed in the tender rays of Soma, glowing in that cool light. He raised his flute to his lips and blew a ravishing melody on it, an irresistible song. The women heard that music and were enchanted. They forgot entirely who and where they were, and their spirits flew out into the silvery night, flew to Krishna, lord of their hearts. Beside themselves, they ran out to keep the long-awaited tryst with him, which he had promised them months ago. They flew through the night, and so completely fascinated were they that each one thought of just herself flying to her lover. They were hardly aware that none of them was alone. All of them had been doing some household chore, now they abandoned whatever they had been doing and ran blindly toward the song of the flute. One had been milking her cow. Without a thought, she set her pail down and followed the magic notes. Some were serving food to their family and set the serving dish down as soon as they heard the first few notes and ran out. Some had their babies at their breasts. They pulled their nipples from their infants' mouths and hurried out into the night. Some were anointing their soft limbs with sandalwood paste, others were bathing, and some were putting on clothes after bathing or making themselves up. Each one stopped what she did and went helplessly toward the blue enchanter in the heart of the jungle, calling them with his great song. Their husbands, fathers, brothers, and other relatives direly forbade them from going to him. Some unlucky women found themselves locked up inside their houses so they could not leave. They shut their eyes and lost themselves in Dhyana and the single thought of him. In moments, all their sins were made ashes by the agony they felt in not being able to go out to the flute song with which their beloved called them. But in their minds, they found him as real, realer than flesh and blood. He embraced them as any lover would, passionately, except that he was God, and they found the Param Atman. When the women arrived in the frenzied throng where Krishna was waiting for them in the forest heart, he lowered his flute. He smiled at them in the silver light of the moon, and how entirely ravishing his smile was, how full of tender mockery. The Bhagavan said to them, Welcome, gopis. What brings you here, and what service can I render you? For certainly I will swell my punya by serving such lovely ladies in any way whatever. Why are you out here at this hour in the dangerous jungle? When your parents, sons, brothers, and husbands do not find you at home, they will panic and look for you everywhere. It is not dharma for you to cause your family such anxiety, my pretty ones. Wives that want the world's honor never abandon their husbands, not even if their men are brutish, unhappy, unfortunate, old, dim-witted, terminally ill, or impoverished. Only if a husband is irretrievably depraved is a woman justified in deserting him. And, O oh gopis, to have sexual relations with the lover, that is to shut heaven's door on yourself, an unwashable stain on your good names. As for me, have bhakti and listen to my legends, Speak and sing about me for sure, and you will love me in your spirits with a greater love than being out here in the forest with me. So I tell you again, go home, women. Go home at once. The gopis heard this and were shattered. They stood stricken and silent, their heads bent, their lips like berries arid with the hot, dry breath they drew. These ladies had abandoned everything to rush out to her blue Krishna. Now they listened to his cool, cruel indifference. 
They wiped their tears and replied in voices choked with love and lust, which they could hardly help or contain. The gopis cried, Lord, do not be so savage to us. We have come to you, abandoning everything. Mysterious one, do not forsake us now. The truly wise love only you. They turn their soul attachment just to you, the infinitely adorable Param Atman. Of what use is any other love, whether of husband or of children? Finally, all those relationships inexorably bring only misery. Our feet can no more take a single step away from you now, so how will we return to Vraja, as you're asking us to do? You have been born in Vraja to protect us, so Krishna, friend of those that suffer, touch us, stroke our breasts that are on fire for you with your hands cool as lotuses. Lay your soft palm upon our love-maddened heads. We are your slaves, Krishna. Do not torment us any more. Krishna listened to their piteous cry, and he laughed. Then, in his infinite mercy, he called them to him and made love with the gopis in the heart of moonlit Vrindavan. Yet he remained unaffected by what he did, so awesomely, so exquisitely, and was perfectly absorbed only in the bliss of his Atman all the while. They now ranged the forest, Krishna and that bevy of more than 100 women. They sang to him in love and praise, and he played on his flute, so the jungle quivered with bliss. They came to the Yamana, her sandbanks like snow in the flowing moonlight. He touched them, caressed them, and kissed them beside the dreamy river, while the breeze bore fine spray into their shining faces and blew the scent of water lilies across them. Now his lovemaking was more flagrant than before. He pulled them to him, embraced them quite wantonly. He ran his dark hand through their hair as he pleased, and slipped his hands into their blouses and stroked their naked, throbbing breasts. He marked their soft skins and limbs with his fingernails, so they cried out in excitement. When they paused in their love play and could think, pride welled in their breasts that this was Krishna, Lord of everything, with whom they were making love. They thought of themselves as surely being the best of all women. Krishna saw that pride in their eyes, and he vanished from their midst like a dream. He wanted to make them suffer, to purify them, so they became worthy of his love and grace. When Krishna vanished, the gopis gasped. They sobbed. They set up a lament. They identified with him so much that when he went from their midst, they began, one by one, to declare that she was Krishna and to mimic him and what he did with amazing likeness. One gopi pretended to be the savage Putana, while another became Krishna. Putana bared her breasts and suckled the infant godchild, who drank thirstily there. Another two gopis now became Krishna and Kaliya. One climbed onto the other's head and began to dance there, crying, Vile serpent, slide away from here and never return, for I am come to punish evil ones like you. As they went along, asking every tree and vine where Krishna was, suddenly they saw his footprints on some soft earth. As they followed the trail of those precious prints, they saw another trail of footmarks interwoven with Krishna's. Smaller feet, a woman's. One gopi asked, who is the lucky wretch that he leads through the forest with his arm around her? Surely she has worshipped him best that he has abandoned the rest of us and taken her into the forest alone. The gopis roamed through Vrindavan in a deranged throng in quest of Krishna, often howling as women possessed do. Meanwhile, the one woman, with whom he had gone alone, for earlier she had been untouched by the vanity of the rest at being with him, also fell prey to pride. She thought, I am the best of all women, for among us all, Krishna has left the rest and just chosen me. When they had made their way under the white moon for a while, she said to him, in conceit, I cannot walk any further. If you want me to go on with you, you have to carry me. Quietly, he asked her to climb onto his shoulders. As she swung her leg over his back, he vanished. She trembled. She realized what happened to her. She beat her breast and cried, Oh my Lord, where have you gone? Krishna, I beg you, show yourself to me. I am your slave, Krishna, I beg you, show yourself to me. As she wrung her hands and wailed, the other gopis arrived where she was and found her like that. Sobbing, she told them what had happened, how she walked alone with him in enchantment and in love until white pride pierced her through. She dared command him to carry her upon his shoulders and he disappeared. The others listened in amazement. They went on together in their quest for Krishna, as far into the forest as they dared, as far as the moon penetrated the canopy above. They arrived past all the lighter forest at the edge of a grim zone of the jungle, which was a forbidding mass of blackness. They dared not go on. Meanwhile, they had come far indeed, most of all in their hearts. All their thought bent upon him, talking only about him, singing of him, often imitating his walk and what he did, as if indeed his spirit possessed them. 
the gopis had forgotten themselves, their homes and families. They were lost in love of Krishna. Retreating from the lightless part of the forest, they gathered again on the banks of the Yamna, where he had sat with them earlier, in love's prelude. Chastened, they sat on sand like silver dust and began to sing his praises, hoping to draw him back to them with their song. The gopis sang at the top of their voices. They wailed and ranted in the grip of their absolute desire. Suddenly, he reappeared in their midst, smiling as always. One gopi went up to him boldly and in a swoon clasped his right hand in both her palms. Another took his left palm, soft and fragrant as sandalwood, and set it upon her right shoulder. Another held her hands out, joined and adoring, received the betel rolls that he had been chewing, and chewed them herself. One gopi lay at his feet and, burying herself, pressed them against her naked breasts as if to cool the anguish, the pain of having been apart from him. One woman felt a pang of rage that her love was unrequited and she bit her lip and cast murderous looks at him. Another drew him into her heart through the portal of her eyes and embraced him there. As the greatest yogis do in dhyana, she experienced mystic communion and ecstasy. Tears flowed down her face and her hair stood on end while she cried out in bliss. They drew off their blouses and, heaping these on the sand, made a colorful throne for Krishna, one stained with the saffron powder they wore on their breasts. The Lord, who is usually enthroned only in the hearts of yogis, now sat upon this exceptional seat which the gopi women piled up for him. He sat there in a resplendent form under the cascading moon, and it seemed that he was the focus of all the beauty ever manifested in the three worlds. Krishna told them, Gopis, I left you for this brief time only to make your longing for me stronger, for you have forsaken your reputations, homes, families, and your prospects in this world for my sake. Why, you have renounced what the Vedas promise as a reward in the life to come, to be out here with me. I wanted to serve your interest, gopis, and I heard all that you said and sang, and I watched everything you did. Precious women, do not make this a cause for complaint against me. Not by serving you for numberless cosmic years can I pay you back for what you have done tonight. Such surrender you have committed, such resplendent surrender. In a night, in one stroke, you have severed every bond of attachment, left every shred of selfishness behind, left hearth and home, and all that is mundane. For me, for love of me. This debt is too deep to ever repay, so let what you have done tonight be its own reward. Now Govinda, who is the embodiment of the Vedas, began the great dance, the Rasa Krita, with the jewel-like gopis. The women linked their hands to form a circle around him, while the moon stopped in the sky to gaze down at the spectacle. No vestige of pride remained in their hearts, but only a spirit of complete surrender and untold joy at being there with him. Using his yogic power, Krishna appeared as many Krishnas now. There was a Krishna between every pair of gopis, with his arms flung round all their necks. Each woman felt she had Krishna to herself, and that he was only with her, and that he embraced her alone. No sooner did Krishna begin his Rasa Krita than the sky filled with devas and their vimanas and their celestial women with them to see Krishna's dance of love. Krishna danced to the sounds of the gopis' bangles, anklets, and the little bells that hung from their girdles. Their steps were measured and knowing. The movements of their arms and hands were full of art and joy. Their naked breasts quivered, their slender waists bent to the music as if they would break. Their careful braids soon came undone and fell loose. Their golden girdles and their colorful skirts clung precariously to their waists as they danced wildly. Now they had him for their lover the immortal one whom the Devi Lakshmi adores and no one else. The gopis felt his arms around their naked shoulders and their necks, his hands upon them, and they danced and sang in absolute surrender. The moon stood still, the night stood still, time stood still. In that cosmic night, Krishna replicated himself, now assuming one identical form for each gopi, and he made love with them all in the heart of Vrindavan. King Parikshit said thoughtfully, Brahma worshipped Mahavishnu to incarnate himself on earth to remove the earth mother's burden of evil and to bring dharma back to the world. Vishnu was born in Amsa as Krishna. He is the one that creates the laws of dharma, protects and teaches them too. I cannot fathom how he committed this most heinous sin of having sexual relations with the wives of other men. My mind is in torment, O Sukha. I beg you to set it at rest. Sri Sukha said gently, The greatest lords of the earth have been known to transgress dharma 
when the mood of adventure is upon them. Yet no sin clings to them for this, as it might to lesser men. The great fire is not polluted by burning anything that comes in its way. Surely the weak man must never commit this sin of adultery, not even in his mind. He that attempts to imitate Krishna's deeds without being Krishna is a fool. What the avatara teaches is for all men to live by, but not necessarily everything that he does. Surely a wise man will not dare to try to emulate the actions of an incarnate god. Beings like Krishna are devoid of any egoism. They are beyond the law of karma. They gain nothing from doing dharma and suffer nothing by doing the opposite. Besides, all those nights in autumn, he exerted his great yogic power, and the gopis' husbands felt that their women were beside them all the while, serving them, talking to them, even lying with them. Those men never felt any tinge of jealousy, nor were they in the least aware of what went on beneath the moon and the stars out in the sacred exotic Vrindavan. In other words, don't try this at home, boys and girls. Unless you two are the avatar of Mahavishnu, don't even think of having sex with all your neighbors, wives, daughters, and sisters. While presenting this erotic tale makes me a little uncomfortable, I think the composers had a strong religious point to make with it. They wanted to equate the experience of union with the divine as similar to erotic love, and that we should all lose ourselves in religious ecstasy, just like the gopis did with Krishna out in the jungle that autumn night. I wonder how many times later religious leaders came to the conclusion that they too were avatars like Krishna and ended up having spiritual orgies with their female followers. Perhaps Jesus and Buddha set a safer precedent with their flagrant abstinence. Just open up Google and search Indian Godman sex scandal and you get 59,000 hits. Krishna must be laughing up there in Devaloka. There is an interesting footnote in the Menon translation of the Bhagavata Purana. When Krishna runs off with a single gopi who had not yet been overly prideful and then abandons her when she becomes too proud, Menon says this unnamed gopi might be the famous Radha. If you're wondering when Radha was going to show up, well that's it. There's no other mention of Krishna's famous consort in either the Mahabharata or the Bhagavata Purana. Krishna eventually acquires hundreds of wives, so perhaps she is simply lost in that vast harem. Next episode, we'll find out what Krishna's evil uncle Kamsa has been up to all this time. We'll get more dirt on why he was so obsessed with making his own kinsmen suffer, and we'll finally get around to the story of his demise. Thanks for listening.